Okay, let's go ahead and bring in my special guest. Hello, Kamal. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Can you hear me great? I can hear you. You sound great. Yay. So you guys have had trouble with YouTube also? Oh, my God. Yes, yes. Uh, we got a second strike over at RBN. So for two two weeks, we can't stream or upload. Oh. We yep. just got another strike, uh, which is our, you know, we, I guess we passed the the probationary period, and so that strike was taken off, but now we just got a new strike, and now we have seven days in which we can't do anything on YouTube, and so we're trying to build out Twitch, potentially Rumble, and some other platforms also, so. No, I totally hear you. Um, I will get into that in just a second, but today uh, my special guest is Kamal Franklin. He is the founder of Community Movement Builders. He's a co-host at Black Power Media, and he's also an organizer to help stop cop city. Uh, before we get into Cop City, Kamal, let's go ahead and talk about what just happened with Black Power Media so we can spread the word uh, to people about that as well. Did they explain to you what the strike was for or was it just kind of vague? Well, it's always vague. Um, the explanation is that we had one, Jared Ball uh, does this annual thing. They haven't done it for a while. They just did it and it's called the Hate Awards. So it's basically where they obviously like just make fun of certain things and whatever. I don't think it's um, and it hadn't aired yet. And so apparently YouTube scanned it prior to its airing and decided to give it a strike before it even aired. Um, and we've already done the appeal process and still uh, they denied the appeal and held up the strike. And so, um, again, it's for a program that did not even air at this particular time. Um, and uh, again, it's the second time it's happened to us where the appeal process is not something they don't give you any information on uh, with the proper way to appeal, what factors they're considering, what part of the video or what particular element of the video it is that they're claiming um, does something against their procedures. They just tell you that there's a strike. They give you a general guideline of why the strike is there, but no more specifics after that. And I think as most people know, appealing it usually doesn't go anywhere. Um, because they just usually reaffirm the reason why they gave you the strike in the first place. Right. And, and they use language who... like, you know, it, um, and I was going to say really quickly, it uses language that it, it goes against their, their company guidelines. And I should say, have you ever seen a YouTube produced movie or video or documentary? They've actually done it going themselves into live production at times and done some sitcoms. There is nothing, nothing that we do on Black Power Media that doesn't have the, the language, insinuations, um, uh, um, humor, uh, uh, topical discussions or, or, or issues that they bring up, which don't go further than anything that we've talked about on Black Power Media. Right. Um, for people wondering, because I, I get this question a lot when this happens, this has happened to a lot of people that I know. Um, how is it that certain people can talk about certain issues and they're not penalized? People have to understand that channels that have like over a million subscribers, they have a representative at YouTube, the actual person that they can talk to. And we don't, we just, it's just a generated message. So we don't have that privilege of actually just talking to someone at YouTube and saying, hey, can you fix this for us? And they'll usually be able to get it fixed. So just wanted to explain that to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to get into Cop City. Um, I think a lot of us, for the first time that we heard about Cop City, it was after an environmental activist was killed. That was the first time I know I heard about it, and I talked about it at that point in time. But I think some of us may be curious, uh, you're in the Atlanta area, what started this in the first place? Like, how did this even come to be, uh, this idea of Cop City? Well, Cop City is an idea that started with the Atlanta Police Foundation. They actually uh, marked up the ideas or put forth the ideas uh, before 2020, which becomes important because during 2020 was the uprisings that took place in uh, all across the country. But after Breonna Taylor was killed, George Floyd was killed here in Atlanta, Rashard Brooks was killed, they decided to dust off these plans and to bring them out and present them to Atlanta as a way to to improve the morale, this is their quote, not mine, of police officers. 
Um, and so as other folks or as the country was wrangling with talking about uh, defund the police, was talking about abolition of police, was talking about finding alternatives to public safety, Atlanta decided to double down and instead decided to go forth with this militarized police training center, which in our expect, uh, um, uh, examination of this and, and what we read out of this was that this would do two things. One, it would continue the over-policing of black and poor and working class communities in Atlanta. But two, this was also targeted towards the movement themselves that were opposed to Cop City. So you had such things, particularly in its original iteration, They've claimed to have made changes based on protesters um, and so forth, but there is nothing in the legal document of what needs to be built, what can be built there that says any of the changes in which they've suggested um, are, are in any way, let's say, held by the force of law, right? So these are just things they have on their website that they've changed, but there's no, there's nothing whatsoever that says they have to stay with these changes. But in its original formation, it had um, uh, a landing pad for Black Hawk helicopter. It had uh, and still has two mock cities for urban warfare training. They claim it will be a, militari a, a, a military grade training center. Um, it also had over a dozen firing ranges on its, on its, uh, um, uh, uh, on its uh, training center. And the other part is that the training center was scheduled or is scheduled to be built on uh, uh, what was supposed to be protected forest land, uh, what we've dubbed the Walani Forest, a forest next to and or adjacent to a working class black community that was actually promised to that community for walking trails, for biking trails, for hiking, for uh, regular park grounds for kids nearby. All of those plans were scrapped the moment the city of Atlanta decided to come out and to create Cop City. We as organizers saw right away that this militarized police training center was not just a place to train the police, but was a place again to over-police black and brown communities. 90% of the arrests that take place in Atlanta or greater Atlanta are of black people, even though in the so-called black Mecca, we make up less than 50% from a high of over 60% of the black population. So again, we knew right away that this was not just a training center, but a militarized outpost um, to try to stop the very people who were organizing against police violence. It's interesting because I assumed, I'm glad you explained how the plans originally started because I assumed that this idea came to be after the George Floyd protest. But that's, that's interesting to know that they actually started plans for this prior to that. Uh, why do you think Atlanta? Because if I'm looking at cities, if someone wants to use the excuse, well, we're going to cities where they have a high crime rate. There are other cities that have a higher crime rate than Atlanta. Why do you think Atlanta and maybe not like think, Baltimore? Well, I think uh, the idea of a cop city has actually been put out in several different places. The, the largesse of this one, I think, is due to the training and to a testing ground that Atlanta has become for police surveillance and over-policing. The Atlanta Police Foundation in particular is the second biggest police foundation in the country, even though the Atlanta police are no more than the 20th biggest in the country. And so I think Atlanta has become a testing ground because it has allowed itself to become a testing ground under so-called black liberal leadership. Um, I think Atlanta is seen as a place in the South, which is quote unquote cosmopolitan, but yet also having some conservative politics in the outer edges and of course across the state. So I think those for those reasons and others um, that Atlanta was seen as a place where they can pull this off. Um, I think Atlanta, you know, and the, 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 the Atlanta Police Foundation um, claimed to have raised $30 million, well, claimed that it was going to receive only $30 million, and only these air quotes, from the city of Atlanta, but it was going to raise $60 million from corporations. And why that's important is that that's part of the idea of the Atlanta way, right? The Atlanta way is that corporations and developers say they're going to pay for something, and the role of, again, the so-called liberal democratic black inst institutions and or uh, uh, electoral officers are to enforce what the corporations and the developers want. So we see this as a continuation of a particular way of doing business that Atlanta has always been down for and why they thought it would be an easy push to get this through. They did not expect the push back 
from organizers, activists, environmentalists, community people, um, civil rights workers, all of these folks who came out and said they were against it, they did not expect that pushback. And so therefore they did not expect the battle that, in, that ensued after they came out with their plans. And I'm glad you mentioned the corporations because here are some of the corporations. I don't believe this is all of them, but I want people to see this because these may be corporations that you support. So Amazon, Chick-fil-A, I'm not surprised to see Chick-fil-A. Amazon, Chick-fil-A, Delta Airlines, UPS, of all people, and, and they're supposed to be, at least the workers are supposed to be going on strike uh, towards the end of this month. We'll see if that happens. Home Depot, Inspire Brands. I don't know what this one is. Um, Axon Enterprises. Of course, Atlanta Police uh, Foundation. The Waffle House. The Waffle House. Did you know, come out? are you aware that the Waffle House is actually one of the, the companies that employs, you know, release prisoners? Mm-hmm. I'm not yet. Waffle House has a reputation as, as being, I mean, they're all conservative companies, but the ownership is particularly right wing as well as Chick-fil-A. Um, and most of these corporations uh, were some of the same corporations that during the uprisings of 2020 and before claimed to believe that black lives matter. And within a, a short period of time, they were uh, having private negotiations and conversations with the Atlanta Police Foundation to fund this project because for them, corporate lives matter and or private property matters. And I think after the 2020 uprisings, again, not only in Atlanta, but all across the country, these same corporations wanted to create a sense of stability for themselves, which is why we've had also this, let's say this uh, uh, reconciliated narrative that from going from the police, again, don't solve crime at the height of the uprisings and talking about alternatives to public safety, to moving back towards all of a sudden we're in some high crime wave and we need the police to protect us. And again, not just from right wing figures, but as we remember in the uh, in the speech that Biden gave when uh, he said, uh, don't defund the police fund the police in the State of the Union address, um, both aisles, both Democrats and Republicans stood up and cheered Biden, gave him a standing ovation for that line. No, you're right about that. This is the Atlanta Hawks symbol, correct? That is correct. The basketball team. Who are owned by the Cox uh, uh, company or Cox Enterprises, which also owns the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is also a huge supporter of building Cop City, both financially through their foundations and editorially through the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Have any of the, the NBA players been involved in stopping or, or protesting to stop Cop City? So far not. We've not been able to reach uh, the ball players directly and have them come out with a statement or even uh, talk to them about coming out with a statement. Some of these are the same ball players who, again, doing Black Lives Matter or wore shirts uh, that only said Black Lives Matter, but I can't breathe. Well, we can't breathe, but we have not been able to reach them to come out and firmly be against Cop City. Mm -mm. And I will say, I mean, you know, a lot of local, so called local celebrities, i.e., a Killer Mike or a T.I., um, folks who are connected, again, to the Atlanta. Black political establishment uh, have also not come out against Cop City. Um, we think that some of these folks who claim progressive politics again have decided to lay low on this, decided to not upset the mayor and the city administration. Um, and again, that is the capitalist apparatus protecting itself and the basically the corporations and developers telling the lower level members of the of 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 the capitalist class, let's say, or those who enforce capitalist rule, that they should not say anything and or be for this. And so we've had here a terrible inconsistency of those who claim to be concerned about Black people, concerned about issues of poverty, concerned about issues of public safety, even as far as concerned about police murders of Black people. They have not said a word about what possibly can happen once this large S police training center is created. I'm very disappointed about Killer Mike and especially T.I. T.I. went to prison. You know, it's just, it, boy, what a joke. 
JP Morgan and Chase, that doesn't surprise me. I feel like we talk about them every week. And of course, Wells Fargo also doesn't surprise me. They stole people's homes. Uh, so I wanted everyone to see this. I want you to see the corporations. And I don't I don't think this is even all of them, but some of the corporations that are supporting this endeavor. Do you think that Atlanta is just the beginning in reference to a cop city? Do you feel like there may be more cop cities created across the United States? Yeah, most definitely. I think even before Atlanta, Chicago has created its version of a cop city. There have been um, uh, cities in Hawaii and California. Once this gets pushed through, or if it gets pushed through, I think other cities will get begin to look at this model. Uh, and we have to be uh, sure to name the model. What we have here is since the Mike Brown killing, um, these police foundations, which existed before, but when the conversations began to be about defunding the police or finding alternatives to public safety. And even though no city really defunded the police or even decreased the police budget, the very call for that activated these police foundations to now be these new avenues of direct funding for the police. And so now you have these, uh, these police foundations which are playing this particular role of receiving largesse from these corporations and then either giving free uh, giveaways to individual police officers. Again, do, during the uprisings, the Atlanta Police Foundation gave a $500 bonus uh, to the police, to individual police officers. The Atlanta Police Foundation provides uh, a network of surveillance cameras, which makes Atlanta the most surveilled city in the country. And if I remember my stats correctly, the ninth uh, most surveilled city in all the world only China having the top eight above that. So Atlanta is the most surveilled city other than cities in China in the whole entire country. And that is due to the Atlanta Police Foundation. So this mechanism of funding um, and the fact that the Atlanta Police Foundation will be responsible for the training. So get this, a private nonprofit 501c3 that is funded mainly by private uh, 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 corporations and some city money is now going to be in charge of the actual training of a municipal police force. This is the first time in history that's happening. But again, this pro pro provides a pathway for other cities to do their version of this private public partnerships that again, puts foundations in control of how policing happens. And I'll say this one last thing on the police foundation. It is a very conservative foundation. The head of the foundation is a right-wing Republican. So these foundations are also lobbying and they're getting resources, again, from the city. Uh, there's a tax break at the state level to give to these foundations. And they're giving money, getting money from private corporations. They are bringing their conservative viewpoints and values and putting that pressure also, not that it needs a lot of pressure, but putting that kind of pressure again, on these liberal uh, 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 public officials who basically will say whatever uh, they are told to say via conversations uh, and workshops and retreats and who knows what else through the Atlanta Police Foundation. So yes, this is just the beginning of something that we are going to see across the country once they see this model uh, at play. I know there was, um, I, I did see video footage of you on the ground uh, at a protest in reference to city councilors when they were about to vote uh, on this, this measure in reference to Cop City. Are you surprised that so many African-American city councilors voted in favor of Cop City? Not at all, because I think I mean, this is not just Atlanta again, but the so-called Black Mecca has always been only a black Mecca for a few black people and usually a pay and play as you go system. And so when I spoke about the Atlanta way, the Atlanta way is basically, hey, because you guys had the numbers, you guys being black folks, we have the numbers. It's it, without a fight. The business community said uh, we will we will sort of without a, a large civil rights movement, without protests happening. Um, we will take down uh, overt Jim Crow um, as long as there's no protest happening here. And in exchange, we will continue to get to run the system as is, the economic and financial system as is, which means they, the, 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 the developers and the corporations, call the shots in Atlanta. 
Um, and so Atlanta is gentrifying at a huge rate. And I'm sure this is happening, of course, all across the country in urban areas, which is basically following a French model where middle class and upper middle class, basically the workers for the corporations, they get to live in the city proper. And then the workers have to live outside the city because they no longer can afford it. It's almost like an economic sundown city where you can come in, you can work, but after your shift is over, you have no reason to be in town. And that's what Atlanta is developing into. And it's done so not behind the back of this black economic class, not around the corner from this black economic class, not in the shadows, but with full consent, awareness and participation on the gentrification of Atlanta. So it is no surprise that they've done this. Um, it's no surprise that this is what's been happening in Atlanta for upwards of 40 or 50 years. Um, all the, the public housing was destroyed under a black mayor and majority black city council. Homeless folks were given one-way bus tickets out of Atlanta during the Olympics under a black mayor and black city council. This is what really the Atlanta way is. It's punishing poor and working class, particularly black and brown folks and pushing them out the city as those who can afford reap all the benefits. This is very scary, Kamal. Like I remember, and I don't know how young everyone is in the chat. I know some people probably weren't even born in the 90s yet, but I remember in the 90s, like Atlanta was the place that everybody wanted to move to, especially if you wanted to enter the music business. People were like, you moved to Atlanta. I remember so many like music groups like started in Atlanta and that was kind of seen as like this black like haven. What what happened? Did people just sell out or well, what happened to Atlanta? I think Atlanta has been good at creating a particular image of itself. And I think there's always, yes, there's always been a certain upper one or 2% of, 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 of the black social strata, um, which either has resources or were able to get resources. And so it has been a friendly business environment for some black businesses. But we always have to remember the vast majority of black folks aren't singers. They aren't actors. They're not in the top one or five percent of economic uh, um, uh, economic or of income levels. Um, they are the working class folks. They are the people who are the bus drivers, the city employees. At this point, the train drivers, sanitation. Uh, these are the folks who work office and clerical, fast food restaurants. The bulk of any city like Atlanta has always been poor and working class people. But these elected officials have only demanded. Uh, begged for at times, but demanded the votes of these folks. And once they get into office, they've never, never tried to address their concerns. It's always been what the corporations again want and what the developers want. And again, that's why there's probably only a few working class and poor intact black communities left in Atlanta because everyone else has been pushed out to the suburbs and surrounding areas. The last time I visited Atlanta, I was actually pretty surprised because I have friends that live down there and I, I just noticed the change. Very different, very much gentrified. And I wanted to ask you about Buckhead as well, because I, I heard a rumor that Buckhead was trying to become its own either mm -hmm. town or, or zip or something like that. Is that still happening? Do you know? Well, it's interesting, particularly how that also plays within the the uh, cop city drama. Um Buckhead, uh, which is basically the northern richest part of the city. It's where most of the corporations have their headquarters. It's where most of the rich folks who are in Atlanta live. Um, and it's where the wealth, so-called wealth is generated. They, particularly after the uprisings, began to protest about high crime. Even though uh, I think another survey was taken that Buckhead would be considered the sixth safest city in the country if it were a city, right? Um, but because of the pictures of people breaking into the mall, the Buckhead Mall, that was used as a rationale for Atlanta is suffering from crime and we must stop crime. They demanded additional police stations, which they got. Um, and they've played a huge role in furthering the call for Cop City. And under the guise of they are threatening to leave Atlanta because they're saying it's not safe, um, through a mechanism within the state legislature, which is a very conservative state legislature. And the city council person in Atlanta is the only, is the only independent. Um, and when we say independent, what we really mean is Republican city council person in the city 
who I must say almost won the mayoral election twice by 700 votes. And she's a white uh, um, conservative. So, and they, in both times, the mayors that did win, the black mayors that did win, basically pulled out their Atlanta card and talked about what, what, what schools they went to, how they are the true Atlanta, how black they are. They called out people like Killer Mike and T.I. to come out and stand with them. And they've won those elections by 700 votes. But the, the, the area of Buckhead has teamed up with the governor to put pressure. And again, I'm not saying a lot of pressure is needed. Basically, they told the mayor, we got this through open records request where there was an email exchange between the mayor and the governor that the governor promised basically to put a cap on and or to stop the bid of Buckhead to become an independent city because the governor liked how Dickens was handling policing in Atlanta. And so that was, i.e., code word for bringing out additional precincts or substations in Buckhead and the development of Cop City. And so the, the governor of Georgia basically stomped out the, the bill in the, in, in the um, uh, um, House of Representatives to, to uh, stop the bill going forward to call for an independent city. And now that what you have here is year after year, they're going to do this to basically put pressure on whatever the mayor is to say, if you don't follow what we want, what's going to happen is Buckhead is going to go and be an independent city and all that wealth will go with it. Do you feel like the the entertainment business has helped or hurt uh, Atlanta in reference to Cop City? So for those who are not aware, there are a lot of celebrities that live in Atlanta. I mean, you have Tyler Perry, you have Usher, like there's, there's a lot of them there. Do you feel like that's helped uh, in reference to Cop City? Have any of those people, like Tyler Perry's very vocal, uh, Usher's very vocal. Have any of those people stepped up to push back against this or offered any type of a statement? No, it's been it's it's been the non-helpful variety. Tyler Perry, in particular, um, the city council person who actually put forth the ordinance to develop Cop City, when that person lost their race um, uh, after they did that, they lost their city council seat to somebody who, at least at the time, was advocating against Cop City. Tyler Perry hired that person right away to work at their office, uh, to work at uh, Tyler Perry Studios. Tyler Perry, every year now, does a banquet to honor the police for their service in Atlanta. And so the, the conservative nature of celebrities who are trying to protect their wealth or their reputation or who don't want to go come out and make a strong, strong stance against the city itself, that is what's held true that these entertainers has, have either been silent or they have capitulated or they've been on the same side of the Atlanta Police Foundation via their silence or their public statements. And so they've been of, of mm. most of them have been of nil support or help in stopping Cop City. Donald Glover is another one. Any word from him? Nothing to my knowledge, nothing at all. He said nothing. Interesting. He had a whole show called Atlanta, for those who don't know. Um, this is a question from a friend of the show, Roger Meadows. Is there a local ballot measure in DeKalb or Fulton County to stop uh, Cop City? There is a local ballot measure, a referendum that's happening in Atlanta proper. We considered doing one. I'll explain what that is. We considered doing one in Fulton and or DeKalb County. DeKalb, Atlanta is in both of those counties, but majority in Fulton County. Cop City is actually in DeKalb County. It's a piece of land that Atlanta owns. The reason we couldn't do DeKalb County is because no ordinance was passed in DeKalb County to make this go forward. And so the, the, uh, the resolutions, um, uh, I mean, sorry, the referendums only allow us to attack, let's say, a ordinance that was passed either by the city council or by the commissioners at a county level. And so that is why we had to do the city of Atlanta. So currently, we have a referendum as sort of like one of what we may be our last legal avenue at trying to defeat Cop City, our last sort of direct avenue at trying to defeat Cop City. And basically, that uh, referendum is that if we can collect upwards of 70,000 uh, um, signatures of people who are registered to vote, then we can uh, basically make a demand that at the next election in Atlanta, which is in November, that they have to put on the ballot the idea for folks to vote, for the people to decide whether or not they want Cop City or not. 
And so we are now doing that. We've raised, it's been an incredible uh, continuation of the campaign to stop Cop City. And again, it's added on national organizations, foundations, and other groups um, in a way that we could not have even expected uh, when we first all started this campaign two and a half years ago. And so these organizations have jumped in. There's boots on the grounds. We have collected close to half of our signatures. We've hired a professional canvassing outfit, which is going to start collecting the rest of the signatures needed. We're pretty confident, although of course not completely, that we're going to reach our, our signature level. And then it goes to the city council to uh, supposedly parse through those signatures, which we think will be another hiccup or a, a place where they try to derail this, um, to decide if the signatures are valid. And of course, if they decide if signatures are valid, then it goes on the, the process for the election. If for whatever reason they decide that they're not, then again, I'm assuming we're going to have some further court battles. But even if we win the referendum, let's say it goes to the ballot, my assumption is that the city of Atlanta, as it has already started, will be going into federal court as it already has and state court to try to stop our process from going forward and stopping Cop City. That is how committed they are. Even if we get a majority of the votes or people who go to the polls to say no Cop City, they have already said, stated, and acted to go into court to stop us from enacting this, res this, re uh, this referendum from becoming uh, basically law of the land in Atlanta and for them to stop building Cop City. Are any of the civil rights activists from the past or present involved in stopping Cop City? Mostly not in good ways. So the Atlanta, the um, the city of Atlanta, this is now two or three months ago, uh, called a, when it felt the pressure, you know, one of the things that we all need have to be proud of is that we've pushed the city and the state to the brink uh, in terms of trying to stop this project where they've uh, uh, um, belatedly, but still, have tried to pull out all the stops um, to try to show that there is some public sentiment for the building of Cop City. So they just recently, about two months ago, uh, did a huge press conference on the steps of City Hall where they brought out all the past mayors, city council members, business leaders, some so-called black celebrities, mostly black men dressed in suits, including Andy Young, who literally was wheeled out to be there to say that they were all in favor, and black, black ministers and preachers also, to say that they were all in favor of Cop City. So the black bourgeoisie, the black uh, upper class, have all come out and rallied behind the mayor and rallied with the corporations and developers to try to get this passed. This has truly been a grassroots effort of, of organizers, anarchists, revolutionaries, socialists, Again, voting rights groups, um, environmentalists, community people. This has truly been a grassroots effort to stop Cop City. Um, and the fact that we've gotten this far um, speaks to the amazing power of organizing. This is what I continue to tell people you cannot rely on. It's really sad sometimes, uh, Kamal, because we think back to like some of the civil rights leaders and activists and things like that. And then we look at where they are today and it's just you just wonder like what happened to them. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad in a way. Um, I'm curious also to see this question came from the audience. I think it's a good question. Is the problem, the privatization and the politicization of the police, is that the problem? No, the problem is, is that the police, the system of policing is a militarized force that operates on behalf of corporations and developers that works to the detriment of poor and working class black communities. And so that in its essence is the problem. The problem is that again, the police arrest, 90% of the arrests that the police make, I should say, are of black people in a city that is no more than 50% black. The problem is that black folks get over sentenced. The problem is that black people get harassed. The problem is that black people get over arrested. And obviously the problem is that black people get killed. Um, that is the problem. The problem is not whether or not the police have training. The problem is not whether or not the police are good individuals. The problem is not whether or not police treat their spouses or their dogs or their children well. The problem is, is that when the police are called to go into communities and to uh, have quotas and arrest people in mass or stop people, they will do that. The problem is, is when the police are called out into the streets to stop movements, to stop protests, to clear people off the streets, they will do that. They will follow orders and the orders that they are following are on the behalf of corporate leaders 
developers in the city of Atlanta. They are not on behalf of the people. Any word from uh, Warnock or Ostoff? Warnock and Ostoff came out with lukewarm statements, not about uh, the building of Cop City. They've stayed out of that, even though we've tried to pressure them to say something. Warnock, who, you know, at one point I helped get help him get his first uh, civil disobedience arrest around expansion of Medicaid here in Atlanta. Uh, Warnock, who claims to be progressive in particular, has not said anything about Cop City except that he's studying it. The only thing we got Warnock and Ossoff to come out, the two senators here, was when the uh, Atlanta police with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation uh, went into the Atlanta bail fund and arrested them and attempted to charge them with white collar crimes, but really was going after them as a key link to the movement infrastructure around stopping Cop City and supporting movement organizing. So the Atlanta Bail Fund has been around for six or seven years. Uh, prior to even the organizing against Cop City, it has provided bail for anybody who has been arrested at a protest to make sure that people can, one, feel safe and participating in protests, aka the civil rights movement, where folks would not have gotten involved in some cases if they did not know that there was a bail fund so that they didn't have to sit in Southern segregationist jails all night. And so we have a bail fund here in Atlanta, as many places do across the country, that help make sure organizers and activists can be free and fight their charges on the outside and continue on their lives, as opposed to sitting on the inside. The Atlanta way, the Atlanta, which is part of a larger task force with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, with the DeKalb County Police, with the Atlanta Police, with the Federal Bureau, of Invest uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, with Homeland Security, they decided to target the Atlanta um, uh, Solidarity Fund um, and to arrest those who were the leadership of that fund. Warnock and Ossoff came out with a statement about that, but only that. They've been quiet. They've been reserved. They've been uh, uh, they've withheld any opinion whatsoever when it comes to the Atlanta, uh, the, the, the cop city uh, building that we are opposing. And again, these are people who claim to be progressive, people who spoke out in other areas and other places, but not said a word here about what's happening in part of the city that they're supposed to be representing. That's right. And some of those organizers involved in the bail fund, they've been, uh, the media has uh, identified them as domestic terrorists. Like that term is just kind of thrown around now to people that are trying to actually just help people get out of jail. So that term mm -hmm. has been pretty loose now and they're just yeah. putting it where they, they want to put it. And I think people need to be very cautious of that. They could call us that too, you guys, anytime oh, yeah. that we have a protest. Well, part of, and part of what the other thing about what's, what's the testing ground around Atlanta is that as your audience probably knows, 42 people here have now been arrested in charge with state level domestic terrorism charges. It's the first time this statute has ever been used. In fact, the statute was passed because of the the, the church killings in South Carolina. Uh, so when a white man killed, went into the church and, and killed upwards of a dozen black people, Georgia passed a domestic terrorism statute and has only now used it. And who have they used it against? Forest offenders. They've used it against people who are literally sitting in trees in tree huts and sitting in campsites below the trees. That's who's been the target of these domestic terrorism charges, the vast majority of folks who've been arrested. These people, neither before their arrest, um, have, have ever been said and or shown to be engaged in any other activity, just to be clear, other than sitting in trees, other than having a campsite. It's akin to doing domestic, uh, it's akin to charging uh, a Dr. King, again, doing the heights of the civil rights movement with domestic terrorism for kneeling uh, in front of a police station. So these folks here, again, the task force that's been created is a testing ground. How far will they get with these charges? And if they get very far, they will bring, be bringing charges like this to a community near you the next time people decide to go out and protest, engage in civil disobedience and or direct action. That's right. This is why it's important to pay attention to local politics. We may not live in Atlanta, but it could be your city uh, next. Uh, Kamal, two more questions before you go. Number one, how can people help support the efforts to stop Cop City? 
If they go to uh, the website uh, Cop City Vote or Vote Cop City, um, you'll see things about the referendum. If they go to communitymovementbuilders.org, they will see a list of other ways in which they can participate and support everything from holding rallies and demonstrations in your city, doing direct action or civil disobedience against the corporations, which again, these are national, if not international corporations who have headquarters all across the country doing protests there looking and seeing the developers doing protests against the actual developers of Cop City. Um, so those are the things that we are asking people to do. And those are the ways in which they can find out more how to support and how to help. Awesome. And before you go, where can people find you? Um, they can go to communitymovementbuilders.org and I'm on individually on social media, um, but they can go to communitymovementbuilders.org to find out more about our work and more about the organization itself. Thank you so much, Kamal. Thank you for having me. I feel like I finally made it because I've now been on your program. Um, and so I'm happy to be in fellowship and camaraderie with you. And I appreciate you letting me come on for a few minutes. Oh, thank you so much. Talk to you later. Peace. All right, guys. I hope you learned a lot there. I think more people need to you need to know more about Cop City. Like I said, you may not live in Atlanta, but it could still happen in your city next. It could be coming to your city next. And we've seen things like this happen before where locally something will happen in one city or one state and then it just kind of spreads across the country. So we need to pay attention to that very much so. Um, I want to go ahead and shout out some of these comments. Thank you so much for this, uh, Telesu. DOD also providing lots of police funding and equipment. There you go. Thank you for this super chat, DC. Did you know that the symbol of the National Sheriff's Union is a literal fascist? Like Mussolini's fascist party, originally from the Roman Empire. I did not know that. That is very interesting. Justin says, you guys didn't know about Tyler Perry. Dude's been foul for a good minute now. Glad the truth is coming out about that fool. <laughs> Justin. Gamer says, stop Cop City, 100%. I'll go ahead and take that comment on uh, Rockfin, Eric. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin, Roger. The boule selling us out as usual, Sabby. Since 1988, New Yorkers been moving to the ATL. The problem is not big money, but the fact that the big money doesn't represent us. We must replace corporate money with cooperative ownership money. This is more representative of our values. Thank you so much for that, Roger. 100%, guys. Uh, this is why I keep saying worker co-ops, worker co-ops, because we have to really find a way to take that power away from a lot of these corporations. Before you know it, they're going to own everything, including us. Let's keep it real.